All right. Calm down, everyone. Here's five more. Here's a fun thing I learned at a session. Strings can play runs all day. They don't care, but not tremolo. It's an interesting thing that if you're a string player, it's probably obvious the same way it's obvious for a woodwind player that they need to breathe. But it wasn't obvious to me. Um, and it happened during a session where I, was I had made a recording order. And usually when I make a recording order, I try to um, make blocks of cues that are similar or that use the same thematic material because the players already know it, they have it in their ears and in their memory, in their fingers, so um, it seems like a good idea to play a bunch of similar cues, you know, right after one another. But there were now a bunch of cues that were spanning over a whole hour or more where the strings were just playing tremolos. And the string players, after about half an hour, they had real trouble continuing because think about the movement that they're making with their, with their right arm. They were just like, our arms are falling off. We need to stop this and play something else, please. So I actually had to change the recording order on the fly because, yeah, their arms were just tired. So make sure that if you have a cue with a lot of tremolo, one cue is not going to be a problem. But if you schedule 10 cues after one another where they're just playing tremolo, their arms are going to be so sore the next day and, you know, they're going to be struggling. They're going to have a really hard time. So, you know, go easy on that. The harp is a wonderful instrument, but it can't do everything you want it to do. It's a common issue with people not understanding how the harp works. So the harp, unlike the piano, does not have all the notes available at all times. It's not a chromatic instrument. It has a scale, a predetermined scale, and the harpist can change every note on that scale, either a half step up or a half step down by using pedals. That means, though, you can't really play chromatic runs on the harp, because how would you do that? It also means if you have rapidly changing keys in fast tempo, your harp player might be struggling to, you know, do all the pedaling. They can cheat their way through a lot of stuff by detuning strings in the wrong key in a way. Like they have a lot of tricks up their sleeve, but this is why often you see two harps in a film scoring session just to compensate for that problem. So the harps are gonna do a similar thing like the dovetailing or the choir breathing where um, if one of them needs a bar or two to change the pedals, then the other one can take over and they just kind of interlock to still make all the key changes and stuff happen. But just be aware um, before you write for a live harp be aware of what it can do, how long it takes to change the pedals, how the tuning works. One thing I was also not aware of um, until I learned about it was that harps have a much easier time playing across uh, octaves because the octaves are so much closer together because it's not chromatic. It's not like the piano where there's actually quite a bit of space between octaves. On the harp, they're actually very close together, so it's very easy for them to jump around between octaves. Brass is loud. I know, shocker. But really, it's loud. Especially trumpets. Like, trumpets just don't give a fuck. I feel like I spent half of my sessions just going, hey, trumpets, can you back off, please? Can you take it down a notch? Or as we say, take it down a dynamic. I can dial it back a little now. <laughs> Be careful. It's telling brass to go for it. So we can, we can dial back the trumpets a little bit, but the performance was really nice. Great. Um, the brass overall seems a little bit behind. So if we could play more on the beat, that would okay. be great. Today we're going to have to, that's going to be the kind of, that's going to be the talk of today. Is yeah, brass, yeah. Is brass beware that we've got a yeah. small swing session? So, so brass, you know, I'm sure you're aware, generally, 
we don't really have enough strings, so just take some dynamics. Obviously, when it's big stuff like bar nine, we have to go for it, but elsewhere, when you're sitting more in with the strings, um, just be mindful of the numbers, please. Thanks. I'm always so careful just letting them play forte or anything, because we always end up saying, oh, can you make that a mezzo forte, maybe? They also need the most breaks because of their embouchure, especially if you have like trumpet lines and they're playing very high and you know, it's just, they're, they need breaks to rest their faces. But so if everyone's playing forte, the brass is gonna be the loudest. They're always gonna be the loudest in the room. They will be heard. They will make themselves heard. It's usually the first thing that comes up when I, um, add a new team member and they've never worked with orchestra before and they see we get like three trombones and three horns and two trumpets maybe a tuba like that's that's a good brass section right there don't worry about it but they will usually say yeah but i'm using this 12 trombones patch from this library is is that are we, are we gonna have enough brass at the session and i'm like don't worry about it the last thing you need to worry about is whether the brass will be heard. Worry about the strings, worry about the woodwinds, worry about everyone else. Do not worry about the brass. Because live brass sounds so much louder than sampled brass. Especially something like trombones. I don't know what's up with that. I don't know why in most sample libraries um, they get these huge like trombone sections, for example, and they sound really bright and brassy, but they have no body. I don't know where that went. <laughs> I don't know what happens there. Um, but they're often, like, sampled brass is often very thin sounding. Um, live brass is massive. You're not gonna need that 12 trombones patch in real life. Three is enough, maybe six, but then you're pushing it. I think that's always, um, whenever we work with live brass, that's the first shocker, just how loud brass is the moment they hear it in the room. They're like, oh, I didn't have to be worried about this at all. <laughs> and look, if you want to beef it up, by all means, we can record it separately and then you can put some compression on it and some distortion always makes it, you know, uh, a little extra, like put some decapitator on it and your brass is gonna sound like twice as big. But sample libraries have been very, very misleading about the size of the brass section. Um, I don't know why. Why do we do this? Why do we have all these like weird, massively large, like 12 horns patches or 16 horns patches or 20 trombones? Like who does that? Do we do that? I mean, look, employ those people, but what is this about? <laughs> Why are we doing this? What kind of flex is this? Like, who can lose their hearing first? Because these fuckers, they're loud. Like, if, in case I haven't mentioned this before, they're loud. Like, ten of them or less can blast your hearing into the netherworld. So, yeah. Um, don't worry about the brass. You can double brass with woodwinds as a color. First of all, something you will see in a lot of literature, classical, but also like John Williams type li literature, is um, like a solo horn, for example, doubled with a solo clarinet to give the horn a different color. Or you can double the horn with the bassoon as well, gives it a different color. Or with the cello section, you know, whatever. But something else you can do is have the woodwinds color the brass an octave higher. What you're hearing right now is a cue that was actually never published. Um, and so you hear low strings just playing an ostinato. Then you have um, the theme played in parallel chords with the horns, with three horns. And then um, an octave higher, you have three flutes doubling the same thing. And it makes for a really interesting color. And in this context, you are going to hear it.
this actually works. This orchestration technique I've taken from uh, Empire Strikes Back from in that whole beginning sequence on the ice planet. There are a couple of moments where the horns do this thing where they play the main theme, the Star Wars theme, in parallel chords and then have three flutes on top of it an octave higher, doubling that, while the strings, the low strings, play some kind of ostinato under it. So this is a perfectly valid technique. I also did it in the Klaus family where I would double the short trumpets with all kinds of woodwind colors um, and where I would also once again double the horns with all the woodwinds uh, an octave higher while the strings are playing pizzicato. Just make sure the strings stay out of the way. That's kind of the one thing because you kind of want to hear that wind orchestra kind of vibe and that's gonna get covered up if you have the strings play over it. Number three, use wide voicings for strings. One of the biggest things that I see a lot, especially from pianists, is that they use these close piano voicings for strings. That's not the most elegant solution that you can have, and it usually makes for very like dense orchestration that is very unclean and has a lot of doublings in it that don't really need to be there. Um, the best thing you can do is use open voicings. So bass will play the root, um, cello will play it an octave higher, uh, then violas will play the fifth, and then second violin can play the third, um, and then maybe first violin can double the root again doesn't really matter, but use wide open voicings for strings, especially if they're just playing chords, you know, try that. It usually makes for much, much cleaner orchestration. Different story for brass. Brass works beautifully in close voicings. Weirdly enough, brass uh, even works really nicely in low close voicings, where usually it gets very dense and uncomfortable. Um, but you can have like close triad voicings um, in the low trombones and it'll sound fine. Uh, same with the, with the horns, it'll sound great. It, it's a bit dark at times, but it's, it still sounds clean. Um, and it's a very normal thing to do in the brass. Not so much in the other sections. With the other sections, you know, you can have three trombones and close voicing in like the tenor range and it'll sound fine. If you do the same thing with like three bassoons, it's a choice. <laughs> um, it, it'll have a very specific sound. Same with the strings. It's gonna sound very dense, very uncomfortable, very, you know, almost cluttered. You know, it's it's not the cleanest thing you can do. There are times when composers choose to do that, though. Um, if you look at all the really dark scenes in Lord of the Rings, for example, that's the technique that's being used. Just really dense, close voicings with a lot of thirds in the lower register that normally you wouldn't do, but it makes for a very uncomfortable dark sound. And, you know, for those types of scenes, it actually really works. Some people have been asking if I'm on Patreon or another platform where they can support me through donations or anything similar. So I've signed up for Buy Me A Coffee. So if you go to the link in the description and you want to show your appreciation, you can do that there now. And thank you to everyone who has already contributed. I really appreciate it.